window of opportunity in which you have given to your church. We seek you. We seek you with a fresh recommitment of our life of surrender to the Lamb, to live for you. to allow you to live through us. To reignite our, our journey of readiness. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and pray. Father, we just bow in awe before you of what you're doing, Lord God. We just are... We just thank you that you are doing things and we are grateful for what you are doing. Lord, it is marvelous in our eyes to see what you're doing in a people, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for just all that you're doing in this season. And we just even, as we have the message today, we pray that you will continue to give us a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Jesus, Lord. We ask for an unveiling of your Son to us inwardly, that we would have inward eyes to see and inward ears to hear what you're saying. We ask that you come to each and every one and all who hears these words, Father, that they will not fall to the ground, but they will accomplish what you sent them to do. And God, we want you to have a people for your very own possession. Oh God, and we pray, may we be those people, oh God, that you have called into this for such a time as this. And oh God, we pray that you will come and set your seal upon our hearts, Lord God. Come and set your seal upon our hearts and have your way, oh God. We ask that you come and you do whatever you want to do. And we just pray for that increase of your life and that decrease of us, oh God. We want to see you move and we want to see transformation come. And Lord, only you can do it. It's all from you and through you and back to you. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Yes, yes. yes. amen. <clears throat> amen, amen. Uh, you can be seated. Thank you, Drew and Bethany. That was a really, really powerful time of worship. Thank you so much. I uh, want to welcome everybody uh, uh, again uh, to say that we welcome you. and glad you're here today. and Welcome those who are joining us online right now as well. We're appreciative of you taking your time as well. So I'm just going to call Josiah up right now and uh, let him go for it. We're looking forward to it. Amen. Amen. The Lord's good, isn't he? You know, he doesn't have to show up among us that way, but he does because he's so good, so loving. Let's just go back to the Lord in prayer. You now we've been in that heart posture, at least you know, I was, I think most of us were. Lord, we just bless you for who you are. I agree with uh, Miss Donna's prayer, Spirit of God, we Thank you for this time in which we live. Lord, this could be, can be, the enemy wants it to be a great time of discouragement for God's people. But Lord, I thank you that you're among us to encourage us, to press on, to go forward, to believe you, to hope beyond hope. Jesus, your faithfulness is everlasting to everlasting. Your faithfulness, Father, to your Son is forever. Lord, you are in working a spirit of faithfulness within us to your Son that resembles exactly that same relationship that exists in the Godhead. We thank you for that. It's not by might nor power. It is by your Spirit. It is by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit of life that brings us into a deeper communion with Christ Jesus, our Lord. I ask, Spirit of God, that you would continue 
to administer and minister yourself to us in that way, Lord. Continue to unlock the chambers of our inward man so that you could fill us fully and completely, Lord, so that we can become that readied vessel, that ready, readied bride, that filled vessel, Lord. Not just an empty vessel, a filled vessel. Lord, I pray. Um, I've been debating on what, how to pray this, but I just prayed here at the beginning. Lord, I pray for the resistance that is against this body to be broken. I'm talking about witchcraft. I'm talking about the religious spirit that's arrayed against you guys in this area. I pray for the breaking of it over, Lord, as it comes against your people here to resist to dissuade, even to attempt to cause, uh, Lord, divisions as it does everywhere in the body of Christ. That's not just here. Lord, I pray, Lord, you read in Isaiah 4 um, about how the Lord comes and purges the daughters of Zion from their filth, and then he creates over them a canopy. <laughs> it's this canopy over Mount Zion, and he leads them, you know, by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Lord, we're asking for that, Lord, not that we understand the battle will continue to come against, but its ability to get inside our perimeter, to affect our minds, our, our hearts, to whisper in our ears, Spirit of God, to get, uh, as so often, the enemy goes outside his boundaries and what he's allowed to do. We ask, Lord, for repercussions to the enemy's camp for him stepping beyond his boundary against this body, against your people, against your leaders, well, the different strikes that have been happening. Lord, we're here to say that you are going to have your way here at Restoration Life Church. Jesus Christ is going to be exalted, lived out, believed on, hoped on, more so than ever before. That the enemy's attempts to... Uh, Lord, discolor you or to dissuade us from pressing into this bridal relationship has done nothing more but to spur us on to go after you more wholeheartedly than ever before. I pray, Spirit of God, right now to everyone in this room, to all of us, but one of those who are a part of this body spe specifically for the spirit of encouragement from Jesus Christ to come into the inward man that the overcoming life that is within the person of Jesus Christ would come against, Lord, the lies and the deceptions and the delusions of Satan. Lord, so much of this is a battle for vision. It's a battle for hearing like Donna was praying. Lord, our ear, and I want this myself more so ever than before in the past, I want my ear to be attuned to you, my eyes to be attuned to you, to make it my right spiritual habit to turn to you when the flood comes, to look at you above the waves that Satan sends. It's not that they're not real. It's not that God doesn't use what the enemy would mean for evil. He does. But Lord, our eyes would be fixed Fixed on Jesus. Fixed. I thank you, Lord, for your heart for this people, your desire for this people. I, I just agree what, with what Ken was, was saying, that refreshing, refreshing like a wind of God in the inner man, blowing out all discouragement, all confusion, disorder. I'm talking about in our alignment with Jesus Christ, His, His, His mission, His purpose, His divine purpose. Um, when the enemy comes in, he just sows confusion and chaos in our minds. It, I experience it myself. And Lord, we're just asking that the confusion would not be allowed yes. among your body. That there would be an intentionality of purpose. 
You would drop that, Lord, plumb line. Lord, there would be a rally, a rally around the will of God in Christ. A rallying, Lord. You lift up. What a banner. It's a call to come to you. To stand together. To fight the good fight of faith. And take hold of the promises that are in Christ. As a people, Lord. Not just individuals, yes. Lord, living stones individually being built into a dwelling place. But Lord, the corporate man, the corporate body is the final, Lord, the final uh, step in complete readiness before your return. Not just one or two, but your body joined together in one life only. Lord, we say, uh, why not here? Why not us? It is your invitation to all humanity. For all who would come. We thank you, Lord, for your pushback against the enemy. Let him know that there are people here who aim to fight and to stand for the will of God. Together. 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 (laughs) You know, it's so hard. uh, It's true in our body there in Dixon. It's so hard when you know know one another, you know each other's faults and you know each other's issues and you, you know, it can be so easy to, uh, to give in to that. But if we can, by the Spirit, be rallied to the intention and the purpose of God, we can come into something Paul talked about, about not knowing one another after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the Spirit of God setting up His residence, His will, and His purpose. We're all moving together after that common goal. Being made ready in the Lord, isn't that right? I know that's the leadership's hearts. I know that's y'all's hearts. It's just battled. It is battled in the body of Christ. So, Lord, we pray for that here. We pray for it across the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you guys for for having me and for coming on Saturday morning. Um, I told Brian I wouldn't pick on him make any Georgia Bulldog jokes, him not being here. He's not here. He promised me he wouldn't watch the Georgia Bulldog game. He'd be tuning in. So uh, I set up a recorder in his house to see. <laughs> Left my phone by the TV. No, I'm, t- I'm totally joking. I'm totally joking. Uh, um, but I'm going to talk about this morning uh, a little bit as best as I can. I honestly have been wrestling in a good way with just what to share or, or maybe, maybe better said how to share it. Um, a few uh, weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I was, I was praying and asking the Lord what, what to share during this time. And uh, the Lord brought me to Revelation uh, 22, verse 17. And uh, you, can, you can turn there. I'm going to look at some other passages. We are going to be kind of uh, jumping around a little bit. Um, let me get my get thing in order here. Revelation 22, 17, very short passage. Um, and it just says, uh, uh, the spirit and the bride say, come. We can go on. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without cost. And uh, the Lord just spoke this to me, which was a premise for this message about this dynamic of oneness between the Spirit of God and the bride at the end. And uh, and we're going to look at some other passages that speak to this as well, but the way the Lord put it to me, He just spoke this, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And I was like, okay, Lord, another passage. 
And he said, Josiah, do you see that level of oneness between the Spirit and His people? That what the Spirit is speaking, desiring, and has been longing for is realized in a vessel. And they are with one voice calling on Christ to return. I said, well, Lord, I understand the principle. I've never seen it in this passage. There's other passages we can look at. And I might be extrapolating more, but I, see, I understand how the Lord works in Scripture. There's the context, there's the exegesis of the Scripture, and there's the revelation of the Scripture, like you see on the road to Emmaus. When the Lord hits you with stuff, you read it a thousand times, and then you see something, and you're like, Lord, that takes on new meaning to me. Part of the reason I bring this up is because of something I felt personally towards the body, and this is um, based on revelation, so you can take it or leave it, but I talked about this during the summer conference. I believe that there has been a release of the spirit of discouragement against the remnant to a level we've never seen before in human history. Spirit of discouragement against the remnant, those who have come out to the Lord, who have said yes, who want to get down, on down the road in the, the readiness journey in Christ, which is lose your own life, and gain Christ's life. A beautiful journey, and I mean that. I'm not saying that facetiously. A beautiful journey of losing the old man completely, every vestige of the old life coming into a oneness of life in the Holy Spirit that we can read about, but corporately has never been realized in the body of Christ. I say that again. Has, that corporately has never been realized in the body of Christ, not to the level that has caused the return of the Lord. I know that's a big statement, but when you think about human history, you think about church history, it's very easy to see how that can be true. Even in the New Testament, you're seeing the deviation of the, from the gospel of Jesus Christ less than 100 years after the, the resurrection. It's sad, but there's also a beauty to this time. I think. Why? Because the Lord is speaking with clarity to his people, to those who have ears to hear what he wants. So, Revelation twenty two seventeen, And then he coupled that with Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You don't have to look at all these. So the seven churches... Uh, each of those, you know this well. I know Brian and Ken have taught on this. We've taught on, on this uh, ourselves extensively with the, uh, the ending of each of the letters to the seven churches. It ends with this, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says says to the church. It's interesting, Drew. Of course, you didn't know. You were singing it about Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Beginning of Revelation 22, Jesus says it, and we can read it, but he's saying, those who do evil, let them continue to do evil. Those who do righteously, let them continue to do righteously. We are in a time where decisions and choices matter. And maintaining those choices in those decisions in the Lord, unto the Lord, for the Lord himself matter. Not for church, not just for a good teaching, not to just be around a good teacher. But choices to go with the Lord in the relationship matter. Time is shorter than we think. And I'm not trying to scare us with that. That's a, that's a beautiful anticipation for me. 
You see that here in the vessel here in the bride. Revelation 3, Revelation 2, to Revelation 22, you see this, this transition. And of course, the promise to those in the book who heed what the Spirit is saying, which is all in alignment with the eternal will of God, the divine intention. He works all things. Ephesians 1, 11, he works all things after the counsel of his will. That is not a differing dynamic. That never changes, right? God's plan in Christ is before the foundation of the world. The fall just meant that Christ would have to come as a man and sacrifice himself. But the plan for us to be in Christ, not having a life of our own, was the eternal plan of God. So now we enter into and what we call the church age, which I actually call it the Christ age. That's a better <laughs> term of the dis of dispensation. Anyways, I don't want to get too bogged down in that. We come into the eternal will of God, and the eternal will of God is seen to be in a person. And in that person, a relationship with that person. And in that relationship, it's about life. And it's about his life in his people. So Revelation 2 and 3, you see this transition to the end of the book. Again, this is the way the Lord is just hitting it, giving it to me. You see those who have heeded what the Spirit is saying, have committed themselves to obedience, to taking, and this is hard in this time, taking seriously what God is saying and letting our whole life be aligned with his life. Not business as usual, not status quo. Not journeying on like things have been and expecting things to remain the same. Don't you find that battled in the body? That's why I started with hope beyond hope. Because a lot of us have been in the church long enough to kind of see what church is all about. You know what I mean? John, you know what I mean? I've been in church a little bit, buddy. I've been in church. All I cut my teeth on the back of the pews. <laughs> right? I did, literally. I actually uh, messed, yeah, anyway. I messed my forehead up on the back of the chairs because they were chairs like this, and I perfected the technique of falling asleep with my head leaned up against the back of the chairs, pretending I was praying. And then I, and then I would... Uh, uh, after church, I'd wake up, and then I'd have, like, this big red dot right on my forehead. And so, anyway, there's certain things that you get, you see in the church, like flesh. Disunity, dissension, schism, multiple purposes, right? Confusion, disorder, selfish ambition. Selfish desires, all these things we can go down the list. That's the negative. But what I'm here to tell you is that God has something more than that for his body. And he's in the business right now to remedy and rectify his house. And it's going to take something, believing in God for a better day for his house. Did you feel that? That's a, uh, that's a battled over statement. It's hard for the body of Christ to trust because we've trusted so much and been disappointed. It's true. And I'm not talking about this house specifically. I'm talking about looking across the nations. Why is that true, Josiah? Because man for far too long has been in charge of the house of God. And with man, there is selfish ambition from the top down and the bottom up. With man, there is disorder. With man, there is uh, abuse of his people and vice versa, abuse of leadership. You know, and so you can get bogged down in what hasn't been 
But we have to allow, I believe this, we have to allow the Spirit of God to raise our eyes up to what should be, could be, and I'll say this, in trusting in God's ability, what will be in our time. I believe that God can bring us into alignment individually and corporately with his son where we are of one mind and one voice in the Holy Spirit of God seeking, desiring, and pursuing him in the exact same way. Doesn't mean there's not different vocations and there's not leadership. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about one life and his people living by one life, Christ's life. Where have we seen that corporately in the house of God? I've never seen that. I've seen beginnings. But what I'm saying is God wants an ending. That ending where we see the return of the Lord, where we see the Revelation 22 dynamic, the end come is when the spirit and the bride are on the same page. And that's not... Theological, that's relational. That is life-based relationship. His life living and reigning in his people. And they are one. Oneness with Christ. Spirit, soul, body. Not just the individual's body, but the whole body of Christ. Talking about the remnant that has come out. I feel I feel great encouragement of God to believe him. Great encouragement. Hope beyond hope. Remember it's Isaiah 60 in the midst of the deepest darkness the glory of the Lord arises. His light will shine and his light is a life, and his life brings revelation, and the revelation comes by way and towards a person named Christ. And a purpose in that son that he has within each and every one of us and in his body. So, the spirit and the bride say, come, come. Then we're going to look at a couple of uh, John 16 here and then John 17 as well. So the message this morning is about this aspect of oneness. And, and forgive me from preaching from, uh, I'm not going to say revelation, but look guys, we're out on a ledge here because we're talking about something we've never seen before in the body of Christ collectively. It was always going to be that way. Something that's in the scriptures, that's not what I'm saying, that it's not in the scriptures. I'm just saying what's, been, what's in the scriptures has been brought down to a low level to be understood within the confines of man's failure rather than the, in the eternal will of God and the divine intention. And God would raise our eyes off of man's failure So we can fit what we read into our, our, generally speaking, the church's bad experience into what God would have, which is something completely other than. When Jesus says they will be one, and we'll read it in John 17. As the Father and I are one, do we believe that we can be that one with Christ as his body, where the same life and only his life, I'm talking about at a nature level, where the flesh is dealt with, it's no longer ruling, it's no longer reigning over his house, but Christ's life is ruling and reigning over his house. Do we believe that that's possible? I like to think that I believe that. But God's challenging it because he's asking asking us to not only believe it, to become it. 
And we're going to have to believe it beyond just a nod. We're going to have to let the Spirit of God rearrange, I'm talking about inwardly, rearrange life source completely. And that can be a brutal journey and process when we talk about the cross. It can be painful to our flesh that wants to rule us. But it's beautiful if we want Christ to rule us. Isn't that true? So John, John 16. We start in verse 5. He says, but now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asked me, where, I, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. And we, we have to understand that the helper there is, isn't just to help us be the best that we can be. You know what I mean? He's the child trainer. He's there to get us completely in a place where Christ is only our life to deal with the flesh, the Spirit of God, dealing with our flesh, dealing with our own, maybe this is easier, maybe because the flesh can be so general, dealing with our own headship. That's what the Holy Spirit is given for, and that's what Jesus is telling us here. He's telling us, look, I'm going away outwardly. And you think that's a bad thing, but I'm doing something better. And we see it in John 17, which is a continuation, no chapters. I'm going to make you one with me. You know, you disciples who I sent out to preach and to teach and to heal in the 70, and yet you're still fighting over who's the best. Who gets to be closest to me? You're still the ones who reject me at the cross. I'm going to take away this outward form that you see of Christ in the flesh. And he was fully God, fully man, with an outward body. I'm going to go away and I'm going to come inside you. And you're going to receive of me as I am. And that which you were will no longer be. And that which I am, you will be of. What a word for the church in our day, huh? What a word for the church in our day. Prides ourself on our outward stuff, our outward forms, our success, our money, our buildings, our giftings even. But yet what Jesus is talking about, the reason the Spirit is coming, is completely lost. But God's recovering. You want to know a great sign of the end? It's the return of the apostolic gospel. It's a return of the eternal purpose of God. Revelation 14, there's an angel flying in midheaven preaching an eternal gospel. Dad was talking about last night the rhema word of God. It is absolutely a dividing line, but that's not the only sign. I'm hearing the recovery of the true apostolic gospel of Christ. And I'm hearing in that the heart of God to bring us to an end of ourself and an end of this dispensation. What does it look like for the world to have nothing in God's people? No hold. Doesn't mean we go through this life angry and can't enjoy the relationship with Jesus. It's not what I'm saying. But at the, on the flip side, we have to understand, like that they did in the New Testament, this place is not our home. This place is not what I'm of. 
not the spirit of this age. I'm longing for the Lord now and longing for the age wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see that here in this cry in Revelation 22, 17 of this bridal vessel. You know, there's a difference between just wanting the Lord to come to get out of something and being a lover, lovesick for her bridegroom. Well, major difference. We can look at this and say, well, you know, the church has been asking for the Lord to come back for a long time. Well, have we really? Because God's desire to come isn't just to put evil away. God's desire to come is to marry a bride. God's desire to come is to have a vessel of like kind at, in nature, a Eve-type helpmate to rule and reign with him forever, an administrative vessel where to send the bride to come before the bride is to come before the bridegroom. They are completely one. Make no mistake, the bride subjected to Christ forever. But that's proven now. This is where that's proven. Not in eternity. Not where sin and darkness and temptation have been put away forever. Now, in this life. This is the dressing room for eternity. This is the time of trials and temptations and testing. To see those who will be completely dependent upon Christ and those who will have a mixture and those who will reject. Isn't that true? Yeah. No, no, none of this is new, but uh, the Lord told me to preach it, so I'm going to preach it. So, <laughs> No, uh, that's, such a, that's such a key issue, and actually, and I'm not trying to steal Dad's message, but when Dad was going through last night, this just hit me so strong. When Dad was going through the difference between the line of Cain, and it was beautiful, and the line of Adam and Seth, you see that lines, and he brought it out very well, the line of Cain were taking up residence. That's what the Lord's showing. They were preparing to remain on the earth. The world was their home. And in Seth's line, none of that is mentioned, as he well said. All it talked about is how long they lived. And they were living unto God with the expectation until that switched, am I wrong? With Noah. Until that switched and they began to enter the city and become those who have taken up residence in the earth. Now, it's not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Doesn't mean we should all go quit our jobs and say, I'm not, of, that's not what I'm saying. But God's pointing to a deeper issue. And I ask us, you know, and I'm not trying to be negative, but I ask us in the body of Christ, how often has it been that there has been a people not of this world looking for Christ to come, not just, not just to put away evil, yes, but because they're in a deep love relationship with Jesus and they want to be sanctified, set apart, and filled with the Spirit of God so much that they are, by their living, calling on the Lord to come. I can't find it in church history. Maybe you can. And I believe that's because um, it hasn't happened yet. And like we're saying, the Lord's return is predicated on the body of Christ being made ready in that oneness relationship. And I've got good news. Good news. And we can read about this. I need to finish John, but... Just like there's deep darkness and deception and discouragement coming more so than ever from Satan and his hordes, there's more of the Lord's in his son grace and presence and will and love that he's going to share with us and amongst us than ever before in human history for those who are saying yes. So let's finish this. We just started, so. 
I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, we'll convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. How important is this believing? And again, this is not just, oh, I believe that Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago when he was raised from the dead. The belief that's being talked about in the New Testament in the Greek word is a, a dependency on that one that you're believing in. When he says, believe on my name. It's putting your uh, trust in the character of that one and knowing that one's character to the ability to entrust yourself to him. And we think believes just, oh yeah, I, I believe the fact of it. God's looking for more than that. Salvation's based on more than that, right? We know that. Because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no, no longer behold me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. God help us to be able to bear what the Spirit of God is saying in this time. God help us to hear, to be able to hear with spiritual eyes and ears the call of the Spirit of God to this relationship. The destiny of this dispensation depends upon you and I believing in going all the way with the Lord. Do you believe that? I believe that 100%. The choices we are making in Christ today in this lifespan, in this generation, have implications to the end of the age. Let me say that again. The choices we are making, and I'm talking about saying yes to the Lord, continuing to say yes to the Lord in this journey, not, in, not allowing um, the enemy to get in and sow unbelief, and tear down what God has built. How about this? Not letting anyone steal our crown. God's writing a book. God's writing a book. It's really easy to look at the Bible and see these names that have been listed. Read about them. But what about our time? God's book has it ended. He's looking to us in this time. So, no pressure. You do the best you can. No, <laughs> I, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally messy. That's the beauty of it. That's, it's not predicated on our best. That's what I love about what the Holy Spirit is, is doing in this time. Is, is He's bringing us back to the simplicity and purity of devot devotedness to Jesus Christ. Where Christ is the one we've believed on. Where Christ is the one we're living by. He's the one we're looking to. He's whittled down the nonsense of the church that has been erected, that has obscured him. Even down to shutting down his power at times. Not that God isn't powerful and he, he gives gifts, but those are given and children can have gifts. Maturity in the relationship is costly costs everything, costs your own life. It's grown, it's built. God will rip your gifts out of your hand to get at your heart if it's out of order because God has something that he's working towards after the counsel of his will and he can anoint the 70 and the disciples not even being infilled with Christ to go cast out demons. And Jesus not even be living inside of them. He can do that. But he'll also take it away. If it's keeping us from coming into the deeper place with him. Right? We understand that. So, verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Let me read that again. Tying this with Ephesians, truth is in Christ Jesus, the person. 
He will lead you into all the truth. It doesn't say part of the truth. It doesn't say some of the truth. We'll read this in John 17. Trying to help stir up our inward man here to believe what the Lord is telling us. To believe that he has the relationship for us that he's speaking about in the scriptures. And it's not a pipe dream. And it's not, you know, us believing in something that, uh, well, that may or may not be true. The scriptures are clear. Man has brought down the eternal revelation of God. God hasn't brought it down to a lower level. He will lead you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it. To you. Then let's go over to John 17, verse 13. I love the high priestly prayer of Jesus. There's so much revelation regarding um, God's desire for a vessel. And you know, of all the prayers that have ever been prayed, the Lord told me this one time, this is the one prayer we can bank on being answered. The prayer of Jesus himself. And really, this prayer should reorder our prayer life. We want to be at the golden altar. I know Ken's talked talked on the golden altar, praying the prayers of God. Jesus, the high priest. This is is a prayer that um, will be answered in Jesus. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 8, that he stands and intercedes for us. If we don't think he's interceding for the fullness of John 17 to come to fruition in his body, we're missing what he's interceding for what he's standing, his life, is really the intercession. And he's not interceding for what job we're going to have or where we're going to live, not that those aren't, things aren't important at all. We should ask the Lord about those. But he's, he's looking for what he gave his life for and what he created us for before that was even, a nece- before that was even necessary to come to fruition within us. And I tell you, if we will go there with the Lord, everywhere else in our lives will be ordered properly around the divine purpose of God. Mainly in that we won't worry as much as we do about this life. And what Jesus says, take no thought for your own life. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. We'll keep our eyes fixed and transfixed on Christ himself and the purpose therein and the will of the Spirit of God to bring us fully in. We'll see our journey differently. We can see even the warfare that's going on against this body and against the body differently. Satan is scared of what you guys are becoming. That's why he's attacking the way he's attacking. doesn't mean y'all are all that in a bag of potato chips. It just means that y'all have said, Lord, we want you. We want you to come. We want you to bring us out of disorder. We want you to bring us out of the stuff of Christianity. We want to know your heart and your will. Bring the revelation of who you are and your purpose to us as a people and bring us together in that and help us to stay the course and to become that eternal vessel that your heart bleeds for. Well, that's 
uh, a challenge to the camp of the enemy. And it's a challenge to the religious. I'm just going to say it. I don't mind. I'm not from here. That's a, it's true of Tennessee as well. It's a challenge to the religious spirit that has set itself up in the greater Atlanta area. That prides itself on itself versus Christ. Paul said, if I'm going to boast, I'm only going to boast in the Lord. In Galatians, I say that I would boast set in the cross of Christ, which has crucified me from this world, in this life, in the spirit of this age. So you all said yes to that, and the battle's on. And God's teaching us to fight and stay committed to him and also resist the devil we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, but Jesus is also a warrior, and he doesn't take guff from Satan. Guff, is that, a, is, that a, is that the right word? I heard it once somewhere, so it must be right. <laughs> He's making a battled, hardened bride that's in love with him and hates evil and stands against it. You know, that's one of the things I do not like about this pathetic gospel that's being preached and this effeminate gospel that's being preached is it doesn't make warriors ready for the day of battle to stand. And then the enemy comes like a, in like a flood and they just get bulldozed because they think they can just stand and worship it away. That's not going to happen. I'm talking about outward worship. Sorry, that was... Christ is going to be the one we're standing on when the floods come. That's going to be an inward relationship where he is a rock and he has hardened us against the enemy. We see clearly. If the eyes of the Lord are aflame, I guarantee you the bride's eyes are aflame. She's not tricked and she's not easily tread upon by Satan. There are repercussions. So, anyway, I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that before. I don't know why I'm saying it. I think it's the Spirit of the Lord encouraging us. We're in a fight. We're in a battle. We're in a battle for the life of Jesus Christ. We're in the battle for this area to have the opportunity to see the light in the testimony of Jesus Christ. And it's dependent. I'm just calling all of us into the ranks. It's dependent on us individually and corporately to allow the Spirit of the Lord to make us into that vessel. He is doing that, but he aims to take it to another level, for lack of a better term. Another level. We have to believe. We heard, we've heard that. Hear me. Don't think that I'm not saying these things and cringing inwardly because I've heard this I'm only 35 years old. I'll be 36 this year. I've heard this my whole life. But not in the proper uh, context of what I'm talking about in this eternal divine will. It's always about you becoming something. I'm not talking about us becoming something. Except for a habitation of God. I'm talking about earthen vessels being filled with the overabundant treasure that he is. We learn to fight corporately by learning by the power of the Spirit to battle inwardly our own will and our own independence from the Lord. It's what hardens us to stand in the time we're in. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's move forward. All right. John 17, 13, we, we're getting there eventually. Now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. And I love, I love what the Lord, the language that Christ is using. You can see it even more fully in the Greek. He's using language where there's no wiggle room for something less than all the way. He will lead us into all truth. My joy will be made full within them. They will be 
one, not partially one, not a little bit one, not one now and again, they will be made one. Fully. My joy may, meet, uh, may be full in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Father, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. I don't need to tell you guys we have a battle for truth in our time at every level, from the government on down. Truth. What is true? It's really amazing. And we have to, again, we have to come to grips with where we are. We live in a time where a man being a man and a woman being a woman is debated. It's how far the truth has come down. Not only that, you could say, well, that's the world. That is absolutely being uh, welcomed into the body of Christ. Absolutely. Again, that's not good news. It's just where we are. But on the flip side, the Spirit of God is bringing us, those, those who are on this path, on this journey, and rejecting that worldly spirit. And it's only going to get worse in that arena. Thessalonians tells us that God gives them over to the deception and the delusion. And those things matter because of those things, the wrath of God abides upon the sons of disobedience. Now, what Paul says, I've heard people say, well, you know, the wrath of God is not in the New Testament. Uh, well, you just haven't read the New Testament. <laughs> anyway, so that's how far gone it is. But remember, it's in the midst of deep darkness that God's light comes. So with all the bad, look to what God would do. He aims, you see this in the book of Daniel, where he aims for us to shine brighter than the stars in the heavens. And that's a life issue. That's a life reality. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word. That would be us would be a part of that. And here it is in verse 21, that they all may be one, even as the Father art in me and I in thee, that they may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Verse 22, in the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I love the language here of Christ. Just as the Father and I are one, that they may be, that they may be one. Just as we are, that they may be. Is dealing again with a life issue. I have to hammer this home to our hearts. Christ aims to be more of our life than we've come to believe, than we've been taught, than we've been told is possible. Something that has been debated long, long and hard by people way smarter than me in the scriptures. But the Spirit of God in Revelation is coming again and telling us 
that there is a life in Jesus that he aims to be to you and I. And more importantly, just in the individual, in the sense of the ultimate intention of God, that's why we're reading out of John 17, he aims for us to be together, fellowship with God and fellowship with one another in this one life. And it is a love fellowship. You know, this purpose, we can get so purpose-driven, and again, I'm talking about the eternal purpose of God, but we have to understand that there is a great heart of love behind it for us. God, who knew no need, who's never had a need, decided to risk it to share himself with a vessel called humanity. You could say, well, you know, the scripture says he needed, you know, the type of Adam and Eve. He needed a helpmate, the bride's a helpmate. God has no need. And if he did, he wouldn't tell us about it. What could we do? <laughs> but he has created a place for us in himself that he wants us to reside in and abide in, that he could share himself from love, in love, with love towards us by giving us his own life, the only creation that has ever been created than ever will be created that gets to be inhabited by the life of God. Can you say yes with me? Yes, I want to be rid of my old man and the old man in the flesh so that I can be inhabited by that life. Can we say yes to the love of God in dealing with us in the cross of Christ to get rid of that old man that adds nothing to and only takes away and obscures the beauty of this one named Jesus Christ? That that testimony of who he is and his great love and his great purpose and his great plan could come through in life. Yes, in proclamation, but in life here in Marietta, there in Van Leer. A life that it gives and shows forth his excellencies continually, whether we're in this building or we're out in the workplace. Where it's not as much as what's said, but the life that comes through us. Yes, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And that's really what I'm getting into here in Revelation 22, 17, with this bridal call for the Lord to come, is that the Spirit, the Father, the Son, the intention has been realized, and it's been realized in this bride. And she's saying, I'm ready. I've be we've become one. I've become one. I'm not just trying to escape something or get out of something. I've become one with you. Come, let's be married. Let's be joined. Let's see the culmination of this relationship and enter into the ages of ages forever. That's our time. That's the invitation of the Spirit. That's why the Spirit of God is dealing with us the way He is as sons. That's why there's discipline Involved because he's training us as sons. For the church, the areas of the church that is reject, rejecting the discipline of God, they're not coming into sonship. I'm sorry, I'm just reading the scriptures accurately. If you're not seeking reproof and asking for the right reproof, not that God is just smacking us around because he thinks it's fun, because he's working to something. And we should be joyful in the midst of discipline. It may not feel good. This is Hebrews. It may not feel good in the moment, but afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. We see the Lord take that place and he comes more out of us than ever before towards our husbands or wives or our children or our family or here amongst us as the body. We say, that was fruitful. Lord, more of that, more of the cross, more of your dealing with my own life. So that which seemed to be an anathema to us, the Lord taking away becomes glorious because he's not just taking it away and leaving us. He's bringing more of himself forward. And we're experiencing more of him. And he ultimately satisfies our hearts. And we want the Lord to come through and be seen. Is that evangelistic? Yes, that's true evangelism. The life of Christ in testimony, being omitted from a body that are one with him, is the greatest form of evangelism there can be. 
well, Josiah, can I go out and share the gospel with people on the street? Absolutely, if the Lord tells you to do it. Do it. If you feel the unction of the Lord, do it. Just do what the Lord tells you to do. Don't get in your soul. Don't get in your flesh. Go try to do something for God. Let God, and this is where he wants his vessel. This is the Revelation 12 vessel. There's a vessel that will not do anything that Christ is not doing, but will do everything that Christ is doing. And it's not a chore, and it's not a burden. It is a life. And life lives. So let's finish John 17. I and them, thou and me, that they may be perfected in unity. That, now that word unity has fallen on hard times for good reason, because we, this is just like Satan, again, and I'm not trying to wrongly cast a judgment over everything, but there is absolutely a false unity movement based on flesh in the house of God. But, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, there is an absolute necessity of the true unity of the Spirit based in this life, bringing us together. I would call it the Psalm 50, verse 5 reality. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Calling us back to the covenant. What is the covenant? It's this person named Jesus Christ, ratified in his own blood. The greatest act of love that has ever been incredible. That God would stoop down into our own uh, wrong choices, talking about man, and be the remedy by sacri becoming coming in a likeness of a man and sacrificing himself for our sake, being our atonement of our own mistakes. Incredible. We don't understand. We don't under, I don't understand good enough the, the continued work of the cross, much less the cross on Calvary. I want to. perfected in unity. Again, hear the way Christ is praying this. He, he, has no, he knows the will of the Father. And the Spirit obviously is clued in because He's God. He's using language, exhausting the Greek language to, in this prayer, and He knows obviously foreknowledge, we're going to read it. <laughs> The exactness of this relationship that we're meant to have with him and one another in this life, in his life. Perfected in unity that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them even as thou loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am in order that they may Behold my glory. The centrality of Christ, brothers and sisters. Holy Spirit, bring us back to the centrality and the preeminence of Christ. So lost, needing to be recovered. You are recovering it, Holy Spirit. Continue your work. May behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. Guys, Having the love of Christ and being loved in Christ is way better than the John, uh, the, uh, John 3, 16 love, for God so loved the world. That love is, is beautiful. It's the creative love of God. But we've been giving a love relationship in the person of Jesus Christ that is way better than that. It's the very same love that exists the spirit of love, Christ the spirit at a nature level amongst the Godhead, we have been brought into in Christ as his body.
That could be a whole message. Verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known thee, yet I have known thee. These have known that thou didst send me. I have made thy name known to them and will make it known that the love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them. There it is. That same love that the Father has for the Son in whom he alone, Christ the Father, was only pleased. We have been brought into that same love relationship. What's that make us? A vessel that gets to receive of something we do not deserve. Even without the fall, we do not deserve to partake of the love and the kindness of God. Yet God in his beautiful, spectacular, immaculate nature has risked it, even knowing that we would reject, to give opportunity for us to come in to that relationship. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness and your love towards us. And help us, Spirit of God, not to squander it on a lesser than relationship just based on need. That's a salvific relationship. But on love in life. Life eternal. So, Y'all had enough yet? What time is it? Okay, it's almost 12. Brian's game starts in 15 minutes. So, no, I'm just, just joking. That's the end of page one in my notes. So, Brian, I'm sorry. I'm holding you to your oath. No, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. Um, uh, you know, there's so much I want to talk about. I do, I do want to briefly bring out this passage in uh, Revelation chapter 5. Dealing with the seven, uh, the sevenfold spirit of God, and then maybe finish in Philippians if that's all right. I'll, I'll try to hustle. You know, the seven spirits of God is a, a an extremely vast topic, and a highly debated one. I've said this before. One of my greatest weaknesses is reading aspects or parts of commentaries, and so uh, you can, I mean, you can find plethora of different interpretations and opinions and all that. But I just want to look, because the Lord hit me with it, when looking at Revelation 3, the difference between what the Spirit is, is desiring to say and those who will heed it. In Revelation 22, in this aspect of the bride and the oneness, the level of oneness with the Holy Spirit, that they're Saying the same thing, I, I, that can be lost on us as trivial. It's not. Again, what is in us is what's going to come out. What's being shown there and written by John is a level of relationship that I have not experienced where there's no distinction. Kind has been achieved. Like kind. But in between that, the Lord just brought up Revelation 5, verse 6. And you can read about the seven spirits of God in uh, Revelation 1 and Revelation 3 and Revelation 4 and um, p passage in Zechariah chapter 4, um, as well as what I, what I think, you know, you can pretty easily tie in biblically of Isaiah chapter 11 of what that represents and the manifold aspect of the Holy Spirit, seven obviously being the number of fullness or perfection. Revelation 5 verse 6 says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled. We were singing that today. Drew's not in here right now, but we were singing that. Jesus be the center. He certainly is in heaven. He's just waiting for him to be enthroned in his church in that way. Anyway, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the Lamb had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And then what's the next little sentence say? 
sent out into all the earth. Is that trivial? It's not. Is it trivial where it's uh, at in relation to the book it's in, where it's at in the book? It's not. We can read Isaiah 11. I will just generally. Uh, that's, you know, you see here the, the different manifestation, I would say, because this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. You can see that clearly in Revelation 1. The seven spirits of God, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the Lord. What does that mean? Jesus. But I want us to see this in Revelation 5 because, again, this is going by Revelation, so you can accept or reject, and maybe it's trivial, I don't know. But the Lord was just showing me in that if we take Revelation as a journey book from beginning where the Lord is coming to his house to correct it and speaking the correction and calling those to overcome, so to heed the voice, versus the end where Revelation 22, that's been achieved. You can see that in Revelation 19 as well. The bride has made herself ready. <clears throat> There's this passage of Revelation 5, 6. And it says at the latter part of that, it's sent out, the Spirit of God is sent out in this way to achieve, I'll, I'll just say it this way, to achieve the fullness of oneness in that time. And I'm here to say, and I'm saying this based on revelation, that that's the time we're in. The intention of the Spirit, as Christ is here seen in heaven. You know, horns represent authority, kingship, power. Eyes represent vision, seeing. But it's not just that He is that. He is sending it out to be accomplished in the earth. And it goes back to what Dad was saying, that the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro to see whose hearts would be made perfectly His. That right, Dad? Josiah, is this some kind of a secret thing? No, it's in alignment with what we've been saying of the intention of the Holy Spirit in this time to bring us in to Christ. You know, there's a difference. You may say this is semantics. So there's a difference between Christ just coming into us and us coming out of ourself into Christ. It's a, head, it's a headship issue, and that might just be semantics of words, but I'm talking about what it really means. Christ has come into us at salvation if we've been born again. Amen, and that's a seed. But the work of the Spirit is to bring us out of ourself into Christ, or His desires purpose, intention. I know Brian's been teaching about the mind of Christ is within us. For in that time, brothers and sisters, let us seek the Lord. It's so beautiful, Drew, how the Lord sets this up. Let us seek the Lord while He may be found. Are you saying, Josiah, and I'm going to use these words from the perspective of in Christ, not just generally something the Lord sends. That's why I'm being careful with even how I Talk about Isaiah 11 because we can all say, well, I want the spirit of wisdom. I want the spirit of understanding and I want the spirit of counsel as if there's something else outside of the Lord himself. You're not going to get those things outside of the person of Christ, outside of the life of Christ. As he increases, he is that within us. And it's not us controlling him, it's him controlling us. <laughs> Amen? So, but the Spirit of the Lord in this time is extending Himself. You know, the Bible talks about grace upon grace, unmerited favor. Well, that would be true for all of us in, in this. Why are we here hearing these messages? If they be God, and I believe they are. Is it because of something we did? Or is it because of the goodness of God? It's because of the goodness of God that we are getting this invitation to be the final 
generation. Let us not hold back, but press on through faith and patience. Dad was hitting that last night. Take hold of the promises. So let's finish in Philippians chapter 2. I'll go very, very quick. I don't promise. I don't make an oath, but I, I'll go quick. Philippians chapter 2. Paul speaking here, he says, If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. And again, tie this into Revelation 22. And what the apostle is pressing there in the New Testament. You want to see uh, an example of them not being ready in the New Testament and not being complete? Well, you can just look at the press of the apostle here in Philippians 2, Philippians 3. If they were ready, it would have been keep doing what you're doing. If they were ready in Ephesus and the book of Revelation, just keep doing what you're doing. You're already there. You're already good. You've already come to completion. There's already fullness, but that's not what the, it is in the New Testament, is it? It's a push, a right push to let God take them beyond. Yeah. You're praying that, Ken and Donna, as well. I pray that for us back there at the gathering, for my own heart. Lord, if we've plateaued, bring us further yeah. in this time. Refresh us in this call to readiness, and may we not, may it not just be a word in a concept May it be a love relationship with Jesus that drives us and holds our hearts. Because when the testing comes, we've seen some. It's only going to continue. The message is not going to hold us. The person and the relationship with that person and the nearness we have with that person and the goodness that we've tasted of his person will hold our hearts. Because no matter what, death, peril, famine, nakedness, sword, nothing can separate that love that has taken hold of our hearts. And he can, so Baron, they're here in verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. What a call. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. God help us in the body to come back to the one purpose and to be intent on it. To be of the same mind about this call to be one with the Lord inwardly and as a body. To not be, look, isolationist Christianity is not the ultimate will of God. There has been times in church history where it was only one or two. During the medieval times, one of some of the dark times, the dark ages, the revelation of God was almost completely lost. Religion was abundant, but life in the spirit was lost. There was one or two, three or four here and there, but that's not the intention of God. And so there's the cycles, and we're in what I believe to be, meant to be, God desires it to be. God's saying it's going to be the final cycle because he has us right where he wants us saying yes. And we're losing our independence and becoming dependent upon the Lord. Intent on one purpose. Let me encourage you. Do not let the enemy get you off on other purposes. Christ is the divine Purpose and intention. Christ is the promise to you. The life that is in that one is the life that has been pr promised to you. Be intent. Be of the same mind. Be united in spirit and by the Holy Spirit to press on into that life no matter what. No matter what. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that Paul said, if anyone else preaches another gospel, even an angel as it would be from heaven, let them be accursed. Paul's telling them, if I come and preach a different gospel, if something happens to me and I come and say something different, reject me because the gospel that was revealed to you is the only gospel. 
And the purpose of that gospel, to bring us in and make us one with that one named Christ Jesus, is the purpose. There is no other purpose. And let your whole life, mind, body, soul, spirit, family, everything be orchestrated unto that purpose. I challenge us with this as we're coming to an end here. To maintain that regardless what your soul squirms and says. Because it's not true. We have absolutes in the body. We have absolutes in the gospel. We have absolutes in the will of God. Let that be an anchor for our soul until the Spirit of God can deal with it. Amen? Listen, I mean, I'm not really even, not like I have some kind of inside stuff speaking to y'all. I'm, I'm just preaching to what the remnant, and I believe y'all are, who said yes, are going to be faced. And it's not going to become less, but we can be rightly hardened against it so that the gates of hell cannot prevail against his house. We've seen too much of hell's entrance into the body of Christ. It's not the will of God, but it's dependent on a life-based relationship that hardens us against evil, but makes our hearts completely open to God. Amen? Amen? So, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another in regards to this purpose as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I would add to that, it's not talking about, it's everything's in the context is regarding this purpose of God. It's not just, oh, you want a car, buy that car for someone else because they, you know what I mean? It's not that trivial stuff that he's talking about. Not that none of that matters in life. Yes, God moves through us very simply to take care of one another, to love one another, to help one another. But the context is in this purpose. Meaning this, it's not just about me becoming something to the Lord. It's about my brothers and my sisters, which is why Dad and I do what we do. Ken and Donna, Brian and Angie, that's what we do Why we do. It's because God has something for you guys. It's not that you don't know it. It's to encourage us to continue to press on in it. So we have something here that's meant to be in the, in the body where we're all going towards that goal. And if a part of the body gets out of alignment, the body corrects in love the body to come back into alignment with the divine purpose of God. That's where we see health to the body. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was all... Also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Let's stand. And I'm just going to close with a, with a prayer for us. Just wait here a moment. Lord, we believe that we stand in the time of Revelation 5. 
where you are sending yourself out to complete and make us fully ready for yourself. We believe you, Jesus. We believe that your desire is not to wait or come at another time to make another generation ready for you, but this generation to see the glory of God made manifest in his house through his son. Lord, I pray for your people here using the word can use, that you as refreshing life would move upon the hearts of your people. I pray that you would come in in an Isaiah 40 type way where they would run and not grow weary, walk and not faint in this race that's set before them. Lord, I pray for a unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace that is not natural, but is supernatural. Pray that again. A unity in the bond of peace that is not natural, it's supernatural. Is it a vessel that has been cleaned out of the old leaven? but has been filled with what the scripture calls and uh, the parable kingdom of God is like leaven, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, would fully envelop, share, release yourself among us as a people. That the leaven of flesh would be gone Pray for oneness of mind and intention in this purpose that is in Christ. In this life, this mystery, the mystery of Ephesians 3, the mystery of this fellowship of one new man, not Jew, not Gentile, one new man, a Christ man. Colossians chapter 1, this mystery of that you made Paul a preacher of, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When that Christ in you is a Christ in us, your body. I pray, Lord, for the remnant of God here, as well as across the nations, that you would refresh and renew a steadfast, right spirit among us. I pray for the divine order of God in his house. Christ the head, his leaders under Christ's headship, and God's people under that headship, under Christ and under your right leadership. I pray for a body, Lord, that is worthy of your name. And that name, Lord, is quantified by a character, a nature. And your body's in that. Just waiting here for just a moment. Holy Spirit, do what you can do, only you can do right now. Refresh the inward man. Break off, Lord, 
discouragement, break off resistance, break off misunderstanding of what you've been speaking. Not, I'm not talking about my message. Just saying what you've been speaking to your body. Lord, the eyes I ask, Lord, open the eyes to see to a greater degree. Open my eyes to see or my ears to hear, my heart in a right position to heed what I'm hearing. Not just hear, be hearers of the word, but rightly by the power of the Spirit, doers of it. Obedience, like in Philippians. Not just seeking our own interest in this purpose, but above all, Christ's. Now, something the Lord told me, and it may be for here, may not be, but He told me, you want to know how to combat the spirit of discouragement? You need an unto God relationship. An unto God. No matter what is happening or we see in the outward, we have a desire to please God no matter what. Discouragement can have no place upon that type of relationship with God. Where God, our, our goal is for God to get what He wants. Lord, bring us all, myself included, into an unto God relationship. It's not just about our inheritance, it's about you getting your inheritance in your saints. Praise would be to your glory. Oh, I pray, Lord, to break the power of darkness. Arrayed against this body again. What you're going to use for training, you're going to use for training. But Lord, we stand against the forces of wickedness that would attempt to Turn us back to steal the crown that you are. Again, I ask for repercussions upon the enemy in his camp. Repercussions. You know what those are, Lord. I don't. And I ask that you would bind Bind this people together in your will more so than ever before. I'm not saying that as a judgment or a negative. I'm asking that, again, Ken said it well, a plateau were to go higher. All of us, I think this is collectively across the nations. Yeah, we may be in a little bit different places, but we're on the same journey collectively into Christ. It's the same purpose. We're getting resisted from rulers and powers and authorities, darkened ones in heavenly places. And they're using the same tactics to try to keep the people of God from becoming fully what God wants. Because when that happens, Satan's time is done. Lord, bind us and knit. That's one of the words the Lord gave me this morning when I was before him. Knit our hearts together with you in your love and with one another in your love more so than ever before. Knit us together, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask this in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Yeah. Amen. Great message, Josiah. Very good. Very good. Amen. Yeah. Be seated just for a minute. Uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to come on and uh, get ready to take up the offering. Um, as I know this is not complete in terms of Josiah's message, but um, 
I just want to make us make a dec declaration of some of the things that uh, some of the points that he made. I think it would be a, a good, and I, if, I, I believe you'll, you will all agree with this. Uh, but as the ushers are getting prepared to take up the offering, let's let's just declare this. We we declare that that we desire oneness with Christ. We declare that we desire our heart to be lovesick and in oneness as motivation to, for us as the bride to say, come. We declare that we do not want to just say, come, just so that we can escape the tribulations that might be coming upon the earth. So we thank you that the fullness of the Spirit the fullness of Christ, the person of Christ, is being sent out to accomplish this objective. And so we say yes to it. We say yes to it that we want to receive of that. For we know that it's impossible for us to make ourselves ready. But we thank you that the Spirit is being sent out with that objective. And we say, come to us. Come to our hearts, Lord, we pray. In addition, we say, help us to be of the same mind, the same love, united in spirit, and intent on one purpose, that there might be a corporate vessel made ready as a bride for Christ to fulfill that dynamic of the, of the eternal purpose of God for Christ to have an eternal partner, the bride, made ready. So we declare that and ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. So the, the guys are going to come and uh, take up the offering. If you would like to um, write a check, make it out to Restoration Life Church. And what we'll do is we will consolidate all of uh, the uh, checks and uh, into one uh, love offering at the end. 100% of what's given today will be given uh, to them. Uh, if you would like to give online, either here or if you're watching online and would like to give online, you can give at restorationlife.org. It's our website, and there's a give tab there, donate tab, and you can go through that, and uh, we'll make sure we get all of that as well. So... While they're taking up the offering, let me just say again, thanks for being here. And we'll meet again tonight at 6 p.m. So it's an hour earlier than last night. 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow will be 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow. So. Hope everybody not quite ready to say. Hope everybody has a good afternoon. We want to make sure the guys have plenty of time here. All right. I think I'm the worst offering taker in the world. I know. <laughs> you know, one of the things, I'll share this, one of the things that really drew me uh, to the Bennetts uh, that I really appreciated was we the first time Don and I went up to Nashville to the conference where Terry was speaking and Rick Joyner and Bobby Connor were speaking and Josiah took up the offer and I didn't I never met him at that point in time but he had the you know usually those confer conferences like that you, you get like a 30 40 minute offering uh, invitation and Josiah had the lowest key offering invitation I never experienced ever experienced at a at a conference like that, and I thought, man, I love that. I just like, you know, <laughs> makes me want to give, you know, when I, when I do that. So, But we do want to give generously, really, really want to give generously to them and bless them for the, this great time. So anyway, God bless. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you at 6 uh, tonight. <laughs>